uh, good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, for the viewing audience uh, who is looking for us to be on a trail with blue sky and perhaps an ocean view, this is a new walk and we have a very special treat. Today we are at the Botanic Garden. Uh, this is a September walk for the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy and uh, uh, we have the uh, superintendent here. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Kevin Kane, who is the superintendent of this garden. And uh, after he talks to you a little bit, we're all going to split up our usual way with uh, uh, various groups with our walk leaders. But I felt it was important that uh, you would meet Mr. Kane and have him tell you, and, and then he's going to also do the video for the viewing audience and show you this wonderful facility. And I think it may not be sunny, but it's much better because we've had very warm weather, so it'd be a great walk. And I'm pleased to see that so many of you have come to participate. So here's. Mr. Kane, Superintendent of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Botanic Garden. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kevin Kane. I am the Superintendent of South Coast Botanic Garden. Welcome. Uh, this is a very nice facility. I'm glad to see everybody's here. Everybody's all set up in their walking shoes, and so am I. I'm pleased to say that I've got the dirtiest penny loafers in, in LA County. Uh, the, our facility is 87 acres. It's, uh, it's, an, it's a nice walk, it's a little bit up and down. We, we have an elevation difference, about 75 feet. So you should, uh, you should be have, have a nice walk. Uh, you will literally roam around. You might be able, be able to, to uh, spend up to two hours touring the facility. Uh, it, like I said, it's 87 acres. Uh, we have somewhere about uh, 5,000 plants or 7,000 plants with about 2,500 different species of plants. <laughs> We've got some interesting collections. Uh, it's, it's a very unique garden. Uh, it, uh, I, our our uh, focus here is to promote new plants for the homeowner uh, and landscaper. And so we're trying to introduce new plants into the nursery industry. And, and so as the trickle down theory goes, that the homeowner will eventually find these. Uh, this, uh, the, uh, part of the unique factor in this garden is that it's, it's built on a former uh, sanitary landfill. In the 19, for between the 1920s and 1950s, this was a diatomaceous earth mine, uh, and uh, a, a company from LA uh, mined diatomaceous earth, which is something used in pool filters and the little tabs that you find in your uh, vitamin bottles to keep things dry. It's a desiccant, uh, and it's a it's a really interesting mineral. It's a, it's it's a actually fossilized microorganisms from the ocean. Palos Verdes Peninsula is a, is an is an uplift. Uh, as you pro probably well know from the ocean and so you find a lot of uh, uh, ocean, former ocean going uh, organisms in, uh, in your soil. We have a ton of fossils here actually, uh, mostly baleen or whale. <laughs> Somebody's, I, I hope it was a hummingbird or something else. But, uh, but the, 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 so you'll, you'll, see, you'll see a lot of the diatomaceous earth here. It's a, it's a white substance, very light, very fluffy. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a challenge to grow things on a landfill. We are literally standing on top of a giant compost pile. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of tons of trash, if you will, were dumped here in between 1952 and 1962 uh, when the garden officially opened. But uh, it, it, there are some unique characteristics about uh, the garden in, in the fact that we are on top of a compost pile. It moves. And if you, if you do composting at home, you know that compost generates heat. So anywhere between three to five feet down from the, our, the cap of what we put on top of the garden, it, the, the temperatures sometimes get up to 150 degrees. Uh, we do, to, because of the fact that we ha do have organic material decomposing after this, this is like 50 years now, almost 50 years, uh, we still have methane generated here, mm -hmm. which, we which we capture, collect, and we ship across the street where it's burned off to create electricity where the uh, uh, sanitation district is so kind to sell it back to us as electrical power. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, I, so I, I certainly hope you enjoy the time you spend here this morning. I'm gonna, I'll be going out with a group and apparently be uh, doing a little bit of filming. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. We do have some photographs over here on the left behind you, uh, but they're kind of before and after. Uh, so this from 1962 when a group of 
gardeners, you know, fanatics, if you will, just like you, who had who were concerned about Palos Verdes Peninsula and conserving space, turned this into a botanic garden as as opposed to just another park or something like that. Uh, and so I, I, I applaud you all for, for your efforts to conserve uh, uh, property in, in the peninsula for, so the general public can use it as opposed to having it developed and put more asphalt on with uh, an area that we have plenty of asphalt already. Uh, so on that note, please uh, enjoy yourself and we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. To your left, to my right, is our children's garden. This is also maintained by volunteers. It was, it was installed by volunteers, uh, by, uh, by a donation from a, a family of volunteers. Uh, and it's based on, uh, what are they, not children's fairy tales, Little Miss Muffet and all that. Uh, nursery rhymes. Nursery rhymes, thank you very much. And so everything you see here is based on a nursery rhyme. And, and those of you that know nursery rhymes, you could probably pick them out. Uh, and, and so this is a particularly nice garden. And it's an area that, since it's so accessible from the entrance that people kind of flock to and bring their, bring their kids. Uh, I want to point out to your right here, uh, is a uh, is a really nice tree. This is what they call a yellow oleander. It's the Vichia thevichioides, uh, and it's a real, as you can see, it's a really pretty little tree. It's beautiful flowers, and uh, the, obviously yellow, and then it blooms almost all during the warm season from, let's say, May uh, through, uh, through oct late October into November. It's, technically, it's a shrub. But this, as you can see, has been trained into a tree form. Great patio tree. Doesn't have a huge root system, uh, and it could, you know, it won't disrupt concrete or anything like that. And, and it, this particular specimen is, is really nice because it gives you an idea of what you can use in your garden. This is what we do at South Coast Botanic Garden: is is to promote different plants for your garden that you can use that you're not going with the, just the, the mundane pedestrian types of plants. And so we will move on from here. Is it poisonous? Yes, it is toxic. Yes, it has little, little, has little capsules of, of, of uh, fruit. Uh, and yes, they are toxic, but I suggest you don't eat anything out of your garden unless you had somebody else ch check it first. Okay. In front of us, behind me, we have our rose garden. It's, uh, it's early fall. And so we're not completely on the decline yet. We do have uh, 16 to 1,700 roses in here, uh, and, and it encompasses about uh, about 100 different varieties. We get new varieties to test out for AARS every year. We get about 10 roses, and they ask us to plant them and see how they do, so, so they so they work yeah, in this area. Garden. So it's a test garden as well. Okay. So and we've just installed uh, the, the new fountain in this area just to give us a little bit more uh, a little bit more oomph. This, uh, as you can see, if you look across the horizon here, we do go we do do go significantly down about 75 to 100 feet and that's where our stream and uh, lake are, which we will eventually get to as we as we move along. And so that being said, we'll move along. This is our cactus garden. Uh, it's it's a I believe it's a beautiful garden. Uh, it's one of the, uh, we have two good, two great cactus gardens in LA County. One's at the Huntington Botanical Garden uh, and this one, which uh, we're very proud of this. Was, this was one of the first things that was installed at South Coast Botanic Garden. And I happen to like cactus. Uh, uh, men and women have different views on it. Uh, uh, men say, you know, cactus are beautiful. They're just like women, you know, but you, you, know, but you can't get close to them. Uh, and women say, you know, cactus are just like men. They're, you know, they're real robust and stout, and they've been, but they're prickly, but they're soft inside. Uh, so as, and as you can see here, we've got a real nice selection. And, and these trees here with the yellow flowers are Parkinsonia aculata. Um, I don't know what the common name is, but it, they're, it's a really pretty tree. Another great patio tree. Hard, obviously, hardly any water, blooms all summer long. Uh, goes semi deciduous during the during the winter, then comes out with these real. It's a very fine texture on it, and it makes for a very nice tree. It does have it does have thorns on it, uh, but you know don't climb your trees. Well, what can I tell you? <laughs> we do, and we have actually in, in here we do have some uh, rare uh, some rare cacti, especially some of these apuntias, uh, which uh, which you, do, you really don't find uh, around. There's uh, 
Burbank uh, was was a was a uh, uh, was a developer of cacti. He's got about 87 different varieties of different opuntia, the pad cactuses, and we've got we've got a fair a fair uh, a substantial collection in here. So it's really pretty. I wish that but we're going to walk around the side here, and I'm going to show you a couple other plants here, which are a great, great patio. And I call I, 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 I'm constantly referring to patio plants because mo most people are. Well, I'm, I'm a condo dweller myself, and as California gets more congested, most people are going to smaller gardens, and a lot of people are going to drought-tolerant gardens. And so you're, you're minimizing your lawn areas, and you're increasing your, your planted areas, or you're doing lawn substitutes, and that's pretty much what we have here. And so there are some tremendous plants that are available that people aren't using, and that's what that's why again we're here. I'm going to I'm going to harp on this all all morning. Is that we're going to show I'm going to show you things that are alternatives to what you're commonly using so that you can save water, save fertilizer, save maintenance, and save having to go out there every Saturday morning, guys, and cut your grass. Okay, let's move on here. What are the ages of some of these? these the, everything in here is, is less than 50 years old. Some of the specimens that went in, you, there's a, you should see the, some of the pictures out there. They were probably 10 or 15 years old when they went in. Okay, so they, were, they had some age on them. They weren't. They had, well, yeah, they weren't like this big. Yeah. So some, some of the larger, some of the larger uh, uh, specimens were about this big. Now, this has been what there since at least. Oh yeah, it's, it was it was it was, it was in the late '60s when it was. Yeah. What's this growing there? Is it like is that? Those are those are florets on. Uh, are that's a, I think it's an echinocactus, but those are those are flower structures on it. Oh. You can see the damage on on that. Uh, we had a, a group of vandals come through here last year and and and, and knock off a whole bunch oh. of cacti. Oh. Yeah. Children have nothing else to do. It looks like. Yeah, okay. Uh, South Coast Botanic Garden is, is in a unique uh, topographical area because we are located obviously at the bottom of Palos Verdes and, and it's in particular we're located at the, at the confluence of two canyons right here. Uh, there, are two, there are two cul-de-sacs above us and the, these two canyons, were, so we're at the bottom of a watershed. We are actually part of the f flood control district in, in LA County because when water comes off the hill, it definitely goes downhill. And it's, we are the downhill part of it. So when it rains, the, the, uh, not only do we have a general rainfall, but when you have a cul-de-sac full of homes, most everybody has asphalt and, uh, and concrete, uh, driveways and sidewalks, and, they, and they, 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 you all get rid of your water by dumping it into the street. It ends up going down the two cul-de-sacs, and when you have 20 or 30 homes on each cul-de-sac, just imagine the volume of water that comes off the cul-de-sac. Now, at the bottom of each cul-de-sac, because I had to go out and figure out why, why we had the situation I'm going to describe, they have a storm, uh, a storm grate, which is approximately two feet by three feet. So when you have an inch of rain over an area that's, uh, let's say, a, a quarter mile square, that rain accumulates, goes down the, the downhill, hits the storm grate and says, sorry, not enough time for you, and jumps the curb, comes down these two uh, canyons and comes through here. So at any given rainfall, the water will be two and a half feet deep coming through here. Doesn't goes right over this one, laughs at it. And if you look closely at this storm grate here, there's water constantly running through it. And, th and this, is, this is just water that's percolating from the, from the soil from above us here. Um, so, that, so this water comes through here, it goes through this area here, and if you, if you can look at that tractor down there, we're actually clearing out some of the non-native uh, shrubs that, are, that have been introduced here from up the street. So our neighbors are introducing all of these, almost all of these trees that you see are, are not trees that have been planted here. And when we go when we go around to the lake, we'll be we'll be I'll, sh I'll point this stuff out. But this is just an interesting phenomenon. You can't drive a vehicle through it, and you certainly wouldn't <laughs> want to walk through it unless you want to go for a swim, uh, all the way down through here. And and, and it's and it's just it's it's really interesting. And we haven't figured out how we're going to solve this problem. So it's two and a half feet above this, above the grade. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you were standing here, it'd be, it'd be at your knees. After wow. it rains. After it rains. Absolutely. Really. Yeah. And well, you can see the you can see the silt through here, and we've got a we've got a riprap down there, and this thing it brings it brings boulders down here, it brings rocks like this, and, and just the the power of the water just comes right right through here. It's it's just it's really phenomenal. 
It makes it interesting. How, does, how do the boulders get through? When they they go right. They go well. They go over that. So they go through the gate. There's, they come through here. They come through here. There, there are holes in this gate. Oh, wow. yeah. It ends in the lake. And that's, an, that's another topic. We'll find that in a few minutes. This is the lake that you've seen pictures of at, at the entrance. It's, a, it's approximately two acres originally. Uh, it was originally five feet deep. It's a man-made lake. And this, you can see the lining here. It has a, like a, 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 I don't know, asphalt and then concrete on top of it lining. It was originally five and a half feet deep and then and, and tapered up. Because of the sedimentation that you've seen that we just, I described earlier, uh, this lake now is about six inches deep. You could actually see the bottom. If you look out there, you can see the bottom. And if, it's too bad the egrets aren't here. It's, it's, it's really a psychedelic experience when you watch egrets, which are a long-legged bird, and they walk across the lake. Mm -hmm. and you, you're going, wait a minute, <laughs> this bird's walking on water. It's very interesting. But and, and, and the other thing that we've had, that where the palm tree is, if, when you see the pictures when you go back, that's an island, mm -hmm. okay? That island's surrounded with water. But right now, those, those are tulies, that weed over there, they're called tulies. Uh, it sur completely surrounds the island there and it's an encroaching on us. And over here, this is papyrus. Oh. Uh, this is also a common landscape plant, but it was, when it's introduced into an area that has lots of water and, and it's only six inches deep, it just takes off like crazy. That is probably doubled in width since the spring. Oh. Whoa. Okay, that's how fast it grows. In fact, it'll probably grow. So keep an eye on it; it might grab you. But uh, <laughs> but this, the, our, then those are all tulips on the other side, uh, as well. This is this is a this is a, a problem that we 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 have to address uh, because we we will we've lost what fish we had in here because the water temperature is so warm because it's only six inches deep, and all you have to do is have a week of 85 degree weather, and you've got baked fish mm. or poached actually. Uh, and so, and the other problem is, and I'll point this out to you too, is that this lake is designed, it's a very interesting design. We'll, we'll see the stream bed over here. To our left, or right in front of us here, that is a release point. It's lower than here, so if the lake gets too high, especially from all this water coming down here, it releases there and goes down into the stream, which is part of the flood control channel through here. Last year, unfortunately, what happened was the papyrus grew all the way over to the edge of the release point, therefore creating a dam, mm -hmm. blocked off the release, and the water came up here and it was running about eight inches deep that downhill that away. And so we, we ended up with uh, some erosion culverts through here that were about eight feet deep and about six feet to eight feet wide. Uh, and wow. then, and then, of course, that s sedimentation went downstream into our stream. And I'm going to, we're going to walk down that way and I'll show you the stream. That's also a man-made stream. And at one point, up until about 20 years ago, there was a recycling, a recirculating pump, sorry, at the, at the bottom, which is about a quarter mile away, recircled the water back up here, and so it was a running stream. It was very pretty. Mm -hmm. And it was an attraction for a lot of uh, residents of the area and kids and stuff like that who just like, love to see you know, wa running water. I don't know what the fascination is. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, if you come around here in the wintertime, you see a lot of running water. Uh, mm -hmm. But let's, let's stop here and we can just, we'll, we'll walk down and take a look at the stream and, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll walk into the juniper section, which is also okay. spectacular. Is, is that the willow tree over there? There used to be a willow tree in the middle of the lake. That, they would be there. It, be in that it, 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 it should be. It, it's probably gone. These are all different. These are river willows here, not the not this the standard a big willow. willow tree. No, if it was in the middle of the lake, it was right there. Okay. And it, it may or may not be there. But you can you can see all those palm trees in there are are, are volunteers. Okay. They were not planted. Okay. They arrived from somebody's palm tree up the up the way. Before I started working for the county, I've only worked for the county for eight years. I spent 25 years in the South Bay as a landscape contractor. And so, therefore, starting to work in the, in the mid-70s, I saw a lot of different trends in landscaping. In the, in the 70s, it was all junipers and pittosporum and low maintenance. You know, that was, a, that was a buzzword. Just don't put anything in my yard that takes a lot of maintenance. So we did a lot of junipers, a lot of pines, and they, you probably, if you live in the area, you probably have a lot of the same type of plants here. And so as we shifted into the 80s, we, we, we made a remarkable shift. 
Uh, everyone wanted to get away from the, oh gee, you know, uh, uh, Algerian ivy, if you will, and ivy and, and junipers. And so <laughs> people went to, let's look, we're going to address the Mediterranean plant issue. So we went into Mediterranean plants. But at this time in the 60s, they said, well, gee, we're going to demonstrate to everybody what you can put in your yard. And so let's plant a whole bunch of junipers and pine trees. And now everybody goes here, well, what do you, why do you have junipers and pine trees? Who wants to see them? You know, but it was, it, was, it was 40 years ago, they said, oh, this is great. This is the best thing you could possibly see. So this is, uh, it's, it, we've got some very interesting uh, material in here, if you like, junipers. You know, so but it's uh, it's but it's 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 it's, a, it's an interesting irony, and as as we go around on our last leg, you'll we'll see our our pittosporum collection, which was in, uh, definitely 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. and our ficus collection, which is definitely 80s, uh, because people got all excited about ficus trees during the 80s, and so uh, on that we'll stop and we'll go on to our next leg. I'm standing in front of a ficus macrophylla. Macrophylla means large leaf. They call it a Morton Bay fig. Uh, Morton Bay is someplace, I believe, in the Pacific. Now, they are a large tree, obviously, and they grow, their branches are very horizontal. Now, if you grow anything for a long period in, har in a horizontal fashion, you develop a lot of weight. And so you think you'd have a problem keeping that up. I mean, hold your arm up for half an hour and see what happens. You probably need a crane or a, a cane or a crutch, something to keep you going. What these guys do, that's why I insist that plants are really smart, they have what they call adventitious aerial roots. See these, these roots here? They'll sprout roots spontaneously off, the, off of the branch. And the roots will eventually get down to the ground where they root themselves. And this is the byproduct. This is a buttress root. And obviously it's holding up part of this tree because this tree says, boy, I'm heavy. I better do something to support myself. And if you look around, through this little forest that we have here, you'll see all these aerial roots and buttress roots growing all over the place. It's just another fascinating example of how, how plants are so smart and what they do in terms of uh, survival strategy. Isn't that fascinating? So if I can get out here without killing myself. This is your basic fig. Now, this is the fig that we grow you know, and, 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 and fig, birds love them, everybody loves figs and fig newtons, if you will. <laughs> and they're all related to all these figs. The, 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 the uh, Morton Bay fig is, is a basic, basically a fig. Your ficus benjamin is a fig. Your, your creeping fig is a fig. They're all related. And these, these little fellows here, the fruit has no flower. The flower, in fact, is, everybody from New Jersey carries a pen and knife. <laughs> the flower is in the middle of the fruit. And you see all your flower structures, in here, in, in, including semen and stamens in here. And th these are, this is where this fruit is germinated. And they're germinated by a species of wasp. Hmm. Wasp, those little wasps, they, they bore into the fruit. They get in here, they fly around, they're a little disoriented. By, while they're doing that, they're fertilizing all the rest of the, the, this, this, uh, this, the female part of the flower. And then they, and then they will fruit. Drop, fruit drops on the ground, boink, and around here, it grows. Mm -hmm. And that's where, these, that's where these figs came from. And I'm going to show you some more a fig down here just to show you how durable plants can be. It's just fascinating. So if I took that home and put it in dirt? It has, to be, it has to be fertilized first. I want to show you an example of the Morton Bay fig that we just looked at. Now, I showed you the seeds, and this ficus macrophylla has seeded itself into this rock. And I've been here for three years and this and this this gets no water. If I may get occasional irrigation water, but this tree is literally growing into the rock. And you can see the adventitious roots on it down here. They will they will eventually grow down the rock and find a water source, that being the soil. And and, and, and in, in actuality and probably in time this this tree will split this rock. There's, there's actually another one over here, but it's a lot smaller. But this is this is just a, this is just a tremendous. Oh, this is Ficus rubiginosa. I'm sorry, it's not a Morton Bay fig, uh, but this is a, 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 in the fig family, the Ficus family. Uh, but it's it's just a tremendous example of of how the durability and how how plants take advantage of their own environment to survive. It's, uh, I just thought I'd share this with you. Yeah.
like a lot of, I guess, decomposed rock right here? The, the rock you see that decomposed off, that's, that's your diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous, diatomaceous soil, this is a very soft rock. That's one of the reasons that this, this plant grows in here. This, this, that's figure, no, that's, this is from that rock. See how light this is? Oh, wow. Okay. This is actually breaking off and weathering off of this particular boulder. Does this have anything to do with the tree growing there? Uh, the fact that it's soft? But yes. No, the, the but no. actually this is, this is very difficult to grow in. Because yeah. it has no nutrition. Oh. So that's what they mined out of here. To be that's here. correct. And then they filled it up with waste, and then right. right. So and they then, must have mined a whole bunch of that. They out. had a whole bunch of it. Big hole here. And what did they use it for? Uh, pool filters, and as a desiccant. Um, desiccant. A desiccant dries things out. Oh. Okay. You know those little packets yeah. that you find in your vitamin bottles? Yeah, and they say, "Do not eat this." Like who's going to? Like yeah. somebody's going to eat that? Mm -hmm. But that's what that's what that's what it is. They use silica gel now more than. Than this, but in, in in the old days, if you will, that's what they used. It, hold, it doesn't hold water. Then. Yeah, it has tremendous water holding capacity. So wouldn't that be like if you mixed it with the fertile compost? Wouldn't that be great for holding water? It, it, you know, it, that's a good question. It probably would, uh, because because it's it's almost clay-like, right. uh, and this does this dissolve it literally dissolves in water into a, a clay-like material. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and it, it certainly does have, it has a, wa a great water holding capacity, but doesn't have any nutrient uh, right. benefits. Right, mixed with compost. It would yeah, be it probably like would. Probably why everything's and it, this probably would raise your pH a little bit, because uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a lot like limestone. Uh -huh. But it's, a, it's, as you can see, it's a very soft rock, obviously. It breaks off quite, quite easily. But it must hold, I bet that holds any water that it gets. In Whatever it. water that this stone, it probably, the whole stone probably absorbs right. exactly. the water. And so it, it, pro it provides a fur. It, and somebody pruned this. You believe? <laughs> but uh, it provides a, fer a f and no, uh, no pun intended, a fertile growing ground for this tree. Okay, so that decomposition has nothing to do with that tree growing no. there. No, no, the tree's not doing that. This is just because of the weather, basic weathering. Yeah, but it's not doing it like on the other side of the rock. Well, like we're we're looking we're looking south here. Yeah. So uh, the, the southern exposure probably gets more heat and, and then cold, heat and cold, and oh. that and that that facilitates uh, that expansion and contraction. It facilitates the weathering uh, of of the rock. Okay. Basic soil science. Okay, let's move on here. Well, we've de we developed a plan for it, but this is going to be rather than just a grass area that one takes up a lot of water, uh, takes up a lot of fertilizer. We're, we're developing this into what we're going to call a, a prairie grass garden, Ooh. and it's going to be all grasses. Ooh, decorative grasses. Decorative grasses. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have a system of pathways through here, and, it, and it'll all be grasses from six inches, eight inches tall to six feet tall. Again, it's a demonstration garden for people to uh, come and see what, what you can do. That's the, this decade, that's what that is. <laughs> that's going to be within, hopefully, by next summer. Yeah, and then people will look back 40 years from now and say, oh, wow. Well, who was that idiot that put that yeah, in there? He put my name on it, I don't care. Yeah. But, uh, no, this, we're, we're developing this. There's going to be another garden in there. That's going to be next year sometime. And I want, I'm, we'll, we'll walk through here. We'll walk through the rose garden. Or maybe we can walk back this way. Uh, and, we'll, and I'll show you the other Mediterranean garden that we're going to be putting in. Uh, it's it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a, a very nice uh, segue from the uh, color areas that I showed you and down into the main, uh, main part of our outback, if you will. Okay, so let's go this way. This is going to be our Mediterranean garden. Uh, we have lavender now. Yeah, we have a lot, lot of lavender. Yeah. We'll, uh, we, because we knew we weren't going to get to it uh, this summer, it's best to plant Mediterranean plants and native plants in the fall or winter. We're going to we're going to establish this uh, once the, we figure we might as well put the sunflowers in for no, for no other reason just to be entertaining. I happen to uh, again, it's a nice thing I'm in charge because I can do almost anything I want. And so I like sunflowers. Go buy some sunflowers. And so we put uh, four or five pounds of seed out here, and this is what we got. So what we've got here is is a, is a serpentine group of uh, a circle of of, uh, of of pathways, and I'm going to walk you through here, and we're going to. And I, you see those pallets of material up there? Mm -hmm. those, are, uh, those are all blocks, dry stack blocks that we had donated. And again, we're partnering with local firms and Thompson uh, Materials, they, they sell rock and, and stone and brick and things like that. And Lomita has uh, donated that material for us so we can put up little retaining walls uh, because this is a slope. 
and we're going to have pathways in here, so you have to have some sort of retention. So it's only going to be about eight inches, eight inches, ten inches high, uh, and then uh, we're going to have, we're going to see if we can get a, a Boy Scout troop in here. So those Eagle Scouts, they'll do anything for that little eagle thing, you know. And and so we'll bring them in, and we'll have them put the put the uh, the stone in, and then we're going to put DG pads, and we're going to walk up this pathway, and then we're going to we'll, we will plant this winter. Uh, we've already got, uh, I think, a couple, maybe a thousand plants uh, that we're going to put in here. And by next, by next year, this time they'll they'll be they'll be mature uh, enough that we, we can enjoy them. Uh, what kind so, of plants? Uh, uh, anything that grows in the, in the Mediterranean climate. Uh, those are all drought tolerant plants. Your lavenders, your sages, typically. Uh, and uh, the young lady that's doing this has uh, is a, is actually a, a California uh, plant nut, if you will. Uh, Quasi expert, and she wants to in introduce those too. And these are plants again as a demonstration because we're right close to the en entrance here, uh, as a demonstration for the public, so you don't have to walk half a mile to look at something. Uh, that you can come here, enjoy yourself, and you know, bring your kids, and it's going to be a, a feely, touchy type thing. Uh, we our census garden over here is the same type of thing. It's the same girl that's working here that's going to develop this. This has been this has been renovated this year. It's, it's still not done, but we're going to uh, that's under construction. Let's walk. If you guys want to walk through, we can walk through here. And I'll show you pretty, pretty much how we're going to do this. Are you, are, are you going to save the sunflowers? Uh, well, we were, we were letting the, the, uh, the birds and squirrels take care of them, but if you'd like to collect any seed, you're welcome to them. And what we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to put a, put a pergola in here. It's going to be actually, it's, uh, I have my finger in everything around here. It's really funny. What we're going to do is we're going to put a, a, a seating area right in here with a, uh, uh, probably something you haven't seen before. It, it's called a um, oh golly. It, it, we're going to have a pergola here with a wall made out of whatever they feed hay hay bales. Okay, but it's going to be a hay it's a hay bale wall. It's it's construction that's used in, in uh, New Mexico and in Arizona quite a bit. And you and you build a hay bale wall and you and you coat it with plaster. And it has an R factor of something like 20, so you can you know you can make refrigerators in there, and uh, and, and it wouldn't it wouldn't get hot, and it makes for a really interesting type of wall. And it's another thing that we can demonstrate to people using their gardens. And I made I, I built I was part of building one at the Arboretum in Arcadia about oh golly seven years ago, and it's still there. And it's it's really it's really a nice uh, it's and it's easy to construct. It's cheap, and almost anybody can do it. And so we're going to have that. And we're going to sitting area, and we're going to walk along this pathway, and you'll see that we go with all these switchbacks through here. Uh, it's going to be a pretty interesting little garden. We already had the in we already had the irrigation put in by Boy Scouts. God bless Boy Scouts. When you do a hay bale wall, do you have to dig into the earth and dirt and build a foundation? Or well, what you do is you, you, yes, you do. You don't have to dig too deep. You put a foundation in. You put a footing in, maybe eight, eight, inch, eight inch footing. You put rebar or reinforced rods. Oh. And you stick them vertically, so when you get your hay bales, you just jam them on the rebar, okay. uh, so they, they so they're kept in place. Uh -huh. And then you put you put your uh, your stucco wire yeah. around it, and then you then you stucco over it. And if you want to be really cool, you get you can if you want some sort of texture to so it's not just flat, you can take like a baseball bat and just beat the bejesus out of the stucco with a wire, and it gives it gives texture to the wall and just and you just. Uh, suck over it. So let's. Houses out of it. Yes, they are. As you're walking along this path, envision the fact. You start, remember, start it down there. This is all going to be planted in between. All right, we're going to have we're going to have some, we're going to have a couple trees in here, but not very big trees. And all, this will all be Mediterranean planting as we as we move up along here. And as you can see, those are the blocks that are going to that are going to be our uh, retaining wall. We we picked a neutral color, so it would so it wouldn't stand out. Oftentimes, when you have things donated, you end up with the pink blocks. <laughs> with a tree in the left. Yeah, this is this is I'm not quite sure this is a sunflower, but it could be. <laughs> so we're going to make a couple more sweeps through here, and the, and see the blocks will go up on the uh, the upside of the slope. So as this is a little wet. It just got water the other day. But we'll cut into the slope here, and so this you can only see uh, it, the blocks only have to be like eight inches high. So it should be a comfortable stroll for almost anybody. I want to thank you all for coming with the walk.
on the walk with me today. It was, it was enjoyable. Um, I hope everybody got a good workout. And uh, the, I want to thank the Palos Verdes Peninsula the Land Conservancy for sponsoring this event. And if you want in, more information, you can get a hold of the Conservancy at, at www.pvplc, that's Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, dot org. There's a phone number I'm going to read to you too, and it's 310 541 7613. And then you can get a hold of the Conservancy at those numbers. And there's the next mm -hmm. event, the next walk is the second Saturday, and it's uh, next month, and it's going to be at Cabrillo Beach in San Pedro. Once again, thank you very much, and I, I had a great time. Thank you.